All right. How's everyone doing? You have endured three or some of you two grueling days of learning and talking and networking. Everyone have a good time at WordCamp Miami this year? It has been awesome. So today our panel is talking about scaling, growing from freelance experience to a smaller team to much larger company. And so we have, uh, we, you may have noticed there's been some substitutions in panelists and moderators uh, throughout the day. So to start off, I'm going to let the, our uh, panelists kind of introduce themselves. Some of you have heard their introductions two, three, or four times today already. You get to hear it again, maybe in a unique way. I don't know. Uh, and and we're gonna, I'm going to also ask you guys just to share a little bit about your company, what you currently, like what this current uh, team atmosphere looks like at your company right now. So why don't we start with you? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Cohen. I am co-founder of Imagine. We're a digital agency uh, outside of Boston. Uh, we have an office in Delray Beach also. Um, currently around 50 people. Uh, most of them in our in our Boston office, and I started. I did my first website in uh, 1996. So, as if you were here the last session, I mentioned I'm an overnight success. It just took me 20 years to uh, to become a success. And you know, one one of the things that you know I, I wanted to say is that I spent 20 years sitting on the other side at conferences like these and, and you know when you're just getting going or if you're just by yourself um, you know and you're trying to grow your business uh, you know you can do it and and um, you know if you have any questions just uh, just ask them I'd be I'd be happy to answer awesome. Andrew uh, my name is still Andrew Norcross I, that's good to know yeah it's uh, worked well for me so far. Uh, I still run, uh, you know, founded Reactive Studios. We're based in Tampa. I like uh, walks on the beach, uh, well, candlelight dinners. I like that. Uh, yeah. Writing complex code that looks really easy. Yeah. And currently we are, we have five folks. It's myself, my business partner, Josh, in Indiana. Uh, we have a gal in Canada who handles support on the commercial product side. Uh, we have another developer, Zach, over on the East Coast, over in Port St. Lucie. Uh, we have a gal who is current. She's moving, I believe, to Alabama right now, like literally right now. Um, and she does a lot of the admin and uh, you know, some of the project management, business development, uh, client management stuff. And we're you know, actually in the process of hiring another developer. So cool. that's where we are currently from a staff standpoint. All right, awesome. And based on that description, I might like to date you. I don't know. I uh, will <laughs> consider that as an option. Uh, Chris, why don't you? Yeah, sure. So I'm Chris Kristoff. Uh, I work on contributing a lot to WordPress core, but I also work with uh, Easy Digital Downloads, which is an e-commerce plugin for WordPress. Uh, we are now between uh, uh, full-time, part-time, and uh, contractors, about 10 to 15 uh, people. So it's been fun to watch it grow. Awesome. Well, cool. So. Let's start off with a, just, a, a, just a basic idea. When, when did you guys, t give, give us a little bit of an idea of what the transition looked like of growing from freelancing, starting from doing things yourself, building your first website, uh, to the idea where you started to realize, oh, I might need help. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background on when you discovered that, like what that looked like for you? Let me just go down the line. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> that works. I think I, I knew, um, right from the beginning that I, I, I wanted to grow a business beyond myself. And uh, the, I, I tell this story all the time that I did this for, I, I had a little printing business and I had one of my clients ask me to do a website and I said, I, know, I don't even know what a website is, but if you're paying me, I'll do it. And uh, they paid me to do it and I launched the site. It took me three days to actually make it work online because I didn't understand the concept of index.html. I, I just didn't know what that meant. I didn't know you needed to name it that back in the day. Uh, so anyway, I spelled the, the owner's name wrong. His last name I spelled wrong and he called me up and, you know, 10 seconds FTP, I fixed it. And I said to myself, Boy, if I printed 20,000 brochures with his name spelled wrong, I would have eaten that. And I said, this is the business I want to be in. <laughs> so, you know, and that was back when you would talk. To, so I, I had only a handful of printing customers, and I, I kind of would go to them and say, hey, 
you guys should have a website, and people had no idea. You know, when I was in a small town, they didn't even know what a website was. Um, but I knew right away that this, it was going to be something substantial, and I told everybody um, who I could tell, you know, get into the web. It's going to be, it's going to be important. And my, my current business partner for 20 years, he was actually a printing customer of mine, and he was a, a marketer on his own, and I used to print all his stuff, but I never actually looked at anything that he was, he was, I was printing for him, I just printed it and he paid me. And, I, and then I started to read his copy, and I said, wow, this guy knows how to write, and he's a, he's a good marketer, and you know, I knew right away that he had something I didn't have. And, and I, I recognized it, and I convinced him. It took six months of convincing, but he finally agreed, and we, that's how we kind of worked together. Is, so the point, is if you're on your own, and you know, I saw a presentation earlier where they, where um, I don't know who it was, but he 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 said the only ships that don't sail are partnerships, and uh, I disagree. If you if you can find somebody who who has a complementary skill set to your own, um, you know, your partnership can sail. It actually brings up an interesting point too. Like you said, I've. I always knew I wanted to build a business, build a team. Uh, Andrew, is that the same case for you? Like you, you set out, I'm going to build a team, or did you just kind of discover you needed a team? Uh, no, I discovered that I hated my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can, like a lot of people can agree with that, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I worked in finance for 10 years. All right. And uh, the last couple of years that I was working there, I worked uh, as a fiduciary asset manager, which is a very fancy way of saying I was in charge of dead people's money. Um, they were dead. They didn't complain. Um, but it was not mine. And when the market imploded in 08 and 09, like, I'd, I'd done it since I was 18, like, in various roles within the, this firm. And while I was, like, I guess I was good at it, I could not have cared less about it. I could not have been more bored. Um, I had started, we had a computer in my house when I was four. I started running code when I was eight. Um, this was before the internet. And I wanted, it was more important for me to be cool than it was for me to keep writing code, so I quit. And I got a guitar, and I got a skateboard, and I did all that. Um, and I started getting back into it around this time, because like my brother's a window tenor, and he's like, I need a website, and he's my older brother. And I'm like, all right, um, I'll figure out how to build one. And that's what I did. But it was a matter of, you know, I was working in finance, and I just, when everything blew up, it just, you know, I, I had clients that lost a lot of money, that it wasn't their fault, and it wasn't my fault but I still felt like it was my fault. And I just, almost guilty. Like it was just like this feeling like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I finally had a reason to quit. Like I, I knew I didn't want to do it, but I didn't know what else to do. And I'm like, well, I keep showing up, they keep paying me. I should probably do this. I had, I had you know, at the time I was married, I had, a, I had a kid and I was like, you know, I, there are people that depend on me. I can't just decide to go up and quit because I don't like it. Um, but then other stuff worked out so I could. And, and for a while, I'm like, I'll just do this nerd stuff to make some money. And it got, it grew to the point, like, within six months, I had to hire someone to answer emails for me. So that was, like, my first person. So that's a, that's a kind of an interesting transition, right? It was just answering emails, like, I'm getting either support requests or questions or whatever the case may be. And your first hire is just, hey, I can't deal with the, the minutia of all of the information coming to me. I need somebody to kind of be a gatekeeper of all the information. Chris, what, was, what, what about you? Uh, well, I started off actually in support, ironically. Um, I, originally, I was I was you know in sixth grade, and I needed a way uh, for at the time a client to do his photography business. Uh, and Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, back up. What, what grade were you in? Sixth. Yeah, long time ago. Uh, and, Did you hear uh, that? Yeah. <laughs> I just so, want to make sure we didn't just so, like jump over that. <laughs> sure. So in bury the lead. Yeah. So in, in sixth grade, uh, e-commerce obviously was in its infancy. Uh, uh, and we started working on this uh, Jigga shop thing, uh, and I mostly worked in the support forums there for quite some time, uh, until obviously the WooCommerce fork happened, and then I stayed at Jigga shop for quite some time. But I transitioned over to EDD at some point, Easy Digital Downloads, which is another uh, e-commerce plugin. And uh, I mean, from there, it's been it's been smooth sailing. Yeah. Yeah. Watching the plugin grow. Very cool. Uh, so you, you hire your first person, uh, you know, for you checking emails, you, you found somebody who was good at writing content, you got involved and started getting involved in a, in a larger team, not just kind of right. working in that isolated. What are the challenges that you've come in with, especially in those first few hires, uh, not being somebody who's worked with maybe managing a team yet at that point? What are some of the challenges you guys have faced? 
why don't we start on the other end this time and come back. Okay. Uh, sure. So, I mean, obviously, uh, the, when, you, when you have like one or two employees, it's not as bad. You don't have to manage. But as you start growing beyond that, you know, you have to start doing managing. You have to watch what other people are doing. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, uh, Corey Miller actually brought this up uh, a couple word camps ago, uh, was the interesting idea that when you're just a team of one, you only have to make enough income to support just one person. But before you can hire person number two, you have to be making twice as much money in order to support uh, one person because that way you can carve out a salary because you can't hire someone before you have basically the money to cover their costs. So, Andrew? Uh, for myself, it was when it's only me, A, it's my, my fault. If something goes wrong, it's my fault. It's on to me. You know, if everything about the whole process, I was the one doing it, which meant if I like something a certain way, that's the way that that thing's going to get done because I'm the only one doing it and I'm the only one seeing it, so who cares? Um, Beyond that, I didn't have systems in place because it was me. Like, I'm not going to like run all of my own stuff through like these like multi-channel project management tools because I'm literally the one entering it and then reading it. Yeah, you know, like it just it would be overkill. Um, but when we started, you know, hiring and, and scaling and having people work with, all of a sudden realize, a, I don't have any processes at all. Um, like, I can't tell them to read my email. Um, like another developer would be like, oh, well, I was on that call, and here's eight words that I took as notes, like literal words. But I know exactly what all those eight words, you know, those eight words constituted a 45-minute conversation. Right. And now I'm not home, <laughs> and they can't work. Um, you know, it, it was one of those things where realizing that what I did and didn't do was affecting other people's ability to do their job. So that's when we had to look at things like implementing systems and process, you know, all the workflows and process, and and then removing ego out of it. Because um, again, like I'm not the easiest person to get along with, um, but I'm also like there's certain things I just like I'll be really like particular about, and certain things I couldn't care less about. And that's everyone's like that with different things, and realizing that okay, if this is something that I'm not going to get too worried about, then I'm not going to try to micromanage it. Um, if it's something that I know I'm going to be pretty picky about, they need to know ahead of time, like, I'm going to look at this. This is something I care about. And, you know, kind of like setting expectations and just trying to keep work at work and not work, like not letting it flow over and things like that. Very cool. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's uh, the, the first employee, uh, you know, can, it comes down to money uh, because you do have to pay that person. But it, it's also time. Is Y'all used to you know, working at 110 percent, just doing your own work, and now you got to carve out a piece of that percentage to manage somebody else and keep them busy. Um, the other, the other piece that was challenging with the first few hires, especially when you have a partner and you're not making all the decisions on your own, is who to hire. You know, so my partner thinks we need a designer, and I think we need a developer, and we end up hiring a telemarketer. So, it's uh, <laughs> pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, you know, I, kind of on that same topic for us, I noticed that as an owner, I think about a business differently than my team is going to think about the business. They don't, it's not their lifeblood. They didn't pour blood, sweat, and tears. They're, they are an employee. And while you want to give them a bit of ownership and you want to build that team culture, it is different. And you have to not, you can't set the same expectation that you set for yourself onto your, you know, team member. And that's, I think, was a hard thing for me in the very beginning was to kind of transition with that. Um, with that in mind, all right, so now that we've kind of opened up the topic a little bit, is there any, does anybody have any questions for the panelists uh, specific to this topic? Yes. Uh, yeah, so that's, a, so that's an interesting topic for you guys, right? So when you're bringing on team members, obviously you have your kind of your benefits package, your salary, what you do, but some companies do offer equity in the business. Uh, is that something that you do right off from the beginning? Have you guys done that yet at this point? Or is that something you're like, you know, they're not going to even tackle that? So for those of you that were around back in the late 90s, um, you know, it was crazy, right? It was, it was we would try to hire somebody and you would have somebody with no experience who had done nothing, 
uh, and say, oh, well, I got offered a job at, and we were out right outside Boston, so Boston was crazy with, you know, the dot-com boom and startups and web firms like us. Um, you know, people would say, well, they offered me, you know, this crazy salary and, you know, four weeks vacation, company car, and they buy, buy lunch every day. And we would sit there and, and stock options. Uh, and we would, you know, we just couldn't, we were two guys that didn't even have, you know, $200 in the bank between us, honestly. So our first key person we did, um, we did give equity uh, and had since bought them out. But, you know, now I think it's changed, things have changed a lot um, over the last 20 years. So, and we're in a position where, um, you know, we, we don't do that anymore. When, um you know, when, when we actually formed the partnership agreement uh, with Josh and I, uh, and at the time, you know, there was a third partner, you know, we had the equity split between the three, everything was based, you know, I had the extra 1% to make it 100, and I'm like, well, I started it, so I get the 1%. Um, and then when the when that third partner left, you know, we, we, you know, we figured, you know, we had written stuff out how we're going to handle it, and we, everything worked out fine. Um, unless they're going to be ownership, like legit ownership at that point, then there's no need to get options because I mean half the you know I remember the dot com, like most of those options were worth less than toilet paper when they were done, and even now there's a whole lot you know you look at a lot of the startup stuff going on in San Francisco like yeah it's insane, um, I think a lot of that culture is incredibly toxic too, um, so you know like I want someone to do a good job I want to pay them fairly. Uh, I don't want to promise them and try to get them to necessarily buy in at a level that I'm already at. Because like as, the, as an owner of an agency, I get paid last. Mm -hmm. My employees get paid first, my contractors get, you know, my employees, if I have a contractor, vendors, anybody else gets paid before I do. Um, if you've got equity, you're an owner. And you get paid last. So, you know, if you've got a huge chunk of VC money, then maybe, I don't know, um, that's not my game. So. You know, for my whole feeling on it is like, no, I just, here's what we pay, here's the benefits, um, we, you know, this is what our expectations are, and I think that's a much more solid foundation to start that sort of relationship. Does that answer that question adequately for you? Any other, any other questions? Yes. So the, the, the question is, if you, you get into this kind of a partnership with somebody, uh, you know, maybe a third person, and then that person wants to either leave, or you, maybe you want that person to leave, um, how do you handle that? What was your situation, uh, if you don't mind? Uh, mine was my wife. Oh, okay. Um, so you kicked her out of the business. <laughs> you are cold. She didn't want to be there anymore. Um, <laughs> she, I mean, she has her own business in addition to being part of mine. Um, when I transitioned from being like a freelancer with a little bit of help here and there, she took over like the management side of it. Um, amazingly, uh, revenue went up like 250% in six months uh, because she did things like email clients um, and, and invoice and, and, and those were quirky things. Uh, but you know, she got to a point where her business was growing and ours was growing to where she just could not do both anymore. Um, so you know, she you know she made the decision like, okay, I'm going to do mine. So all of our stuff that we'd written up and all our documentation, I mean, all our, our agreements said how that was going to be handled. Um, so at that point, it wasn't a question anymore about, it wasn't personal. It wasn't trying to come up with, well, what do we think is fair? You know, it was, here's what the legal document that we all signed that was written by a lawyer says. Um, at that point, there was no debate or argument anymore. Um, all that stuff should absolutely be written up by a lawyer, pay a competent lawyer to do it, and then pay another lawyer to read it if you ever have to use it. Um, I'm a big fan of paying professionals to do what they do best. I'm not an attorney, so I don't try to be one. Yeah, and the key is do it when you're all friends uh, up front. So, you, you know, what we, we did, we had an exit strategy in place um, right from the beginning. So everybody understood that if this happened, this is what it was going to be. And if X, you know, if this happened, that's what it was going to be. We all agreed to it when we were friends. And, uh, and when we weren't friends anymore, it, it's, we executed on what we had agreed on. So, and when I say we were friends, but, it, you know, it ended. Yes? Were you ever making the transition from a freelance to a regular business or a solid business partnership? When you were freelancing, were you in 
encouraged to incorporate or form some kind of uh, LLC while you were still freelancing, or did you wait until you formed a company and then started looking at the possibility of incorporating? Yeah, I well, for me, I had a little company. You know, I had like an S corp printing shop, but when when I met my partner, we started doing some projects. He had his own little thing, I had my own little thing, and we started doing stuff together. And we would just kind of, he would build some of them from his company, I would build from my company. And then once we kind of knew that it was gonna be real, then we, we incorporated it, you know, and we did the, I mean, the incorporation part's not expensive, uh, especially now. Uh, you, can, you can do it yourself for about $100. I saw Chris leaning in a little bit. Do you yeah, have some thoughts on yeah that? so uh, that was probably one of my larger regrets of not doing it earlier. Um, I would definitely recommend doing it, particularly if you're in client work where you can get uh, one person extremely pissed off. Uh, because if you don't LLC, then they can start going after you in other places. So yeah, definitely if you're, if you're a freelancer and you're above the point where it's no longer a hobby and you're considering doing it for a very long time, it's really cheap and there's a lot of services that can do it for you. I, I, and I would add to that to, again, uh, to, to kind of echo what Andrew said, find a good tax lawyer, find a good lawyer to kind of uh, walk through that process with you because an LLC may not be the best organization structure for you. You may need to do something more like an S-Corp. It just depends on what your future goals are and where you're headed. So And what state you're in. in what state yeah. you're in. Yeah. All of those things are, are major factors. So, yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Another question? So we're talking now, right, about a, a little bit away from the team, more in the partnership structure, but we'll, we'll address this kind of briefly. Um, but the idea of when you are a partner, how do you determine, how do you set up the, the gauge, or is there, do you ever find yourself in a situation where um, you maybe one part, you feel one partner's putting more in than the other partner, and how do you kind of deal with that kind of dynamic? Um, for ourselves, I, my, I have a partner, we're 50-50, and I just assume he's doing as much as I'm doing at any given time, even though we do very different things, but that doesn't always work, so do you guys have some thoughts on that? Yeah, so my, my partner's a 50-50, and um, you know, we formed it early on, like literally when we had nothing, so it, it wasn't about who brought what to the table, and um, we, before, you know, like I had said earlier, we had worked together for six months before we actually formed the partnership. So I kind of knew what I was getting. And to be honest with you, it took six months because I was at a different stage in my life than, than my partner was. I was married, I had, a, I had a daughter, he was single, and he used to see me like crazy hours with my own little shop. He, he'd come in and see me in there from like seven in the morning till 11 at night. And he, and he didn't want to be my partner because he thought he couldn't do what I was doing initially. He's like, I don't want to work like that. I want to wake up and, at 10 o'clock and go to the gym and go tanning. Like that was kind of his mentality. And then, and then finally he kind of came around and said, okay, I'm ready to do it. So, um, but one of the, one of the good things, um, and you guys that have partners can, can kind of speak to this too about having a, a good partner is that you go through times in your life where you have other things, life itself, that's distracting. And it's great to have a partner that can actually pick up the load while you are distracting, being distracted, doing some real estate trans, you know, buying a house or moving or traveling or raising kids or, you know, doing things like that. It's good to have a partner who can, especially when you're just you two, who can actually pick up the slack for you and you can do the same. So, you know, you don't want to go into a partnership lightly, you know, with someone you meet for an hour at lunch outside. You have to, you have to get in, uh, you know, maybe a less formal relationship first and make sure that, that you're aligned on, on, um, with, with the same goals. Yeah, like for us, like we actually pay ourselves a, a set salary. It's not a percentage of, of, you know, we, whatever's left over, like we'll do like year end bonuses for ourselves and just divide it up. Um, but other than that, like, I don't want to get in the habit of A, spending more time worrying about what someone else is doing than what I'm doing. Uh, also, you know, I, I kind of fall back to the idea that, you know, like most people, I'm going to judge everybody else by their actions, but me by my intent. 
So it's like, oh, well, I, I know that I didn't get quite as much done this week because of, you know, I was at the doctor with, you know, with one of the kids and then, you know, this, that, and the other. But I'm going to look at, like, oh, well, they just didn't get their shit done. Um, I just, like, I don't want to start breeding resentment, you know, with, the, with someone that I'm trying to build something with. Um, and so I just don't even think about it. Like, did the work get done? Yes or no? Um, you know, is it something where, you know, we've got a good relationship to the point where, like, if there's something coming up, you know, saying ahead of time, I'm going to need a hand so we can reach this date. Um, you know, kind of the idea, like, with employees, it's like, I can deal with bad news. I don't like surprises. So, you know, I, I have a, a level of trust in my business partner that I'm not going to be left out to dry and vice versa. So I'm not worried, like, oh, this week, you know, I'm not going to keep tabs. You know, that's just not healthy. Yeah, and I think if you're going to go into partnership with somebody, you need to, there has to be a level of trust. Like, there has to be, I, I know who you are, I know what you do, and I, I, I know you've got my back. Uh, from our perspective, I, I handle the business side of the business and the marketing side and the sales side, and my partner handles all the technical side of it. And that's really important to me because on a Saturday night, if something crashes, I need to know that I have somebody who's vested to get up and fix it, whatever it is, because I can't do it. And so you need to have that level of trust that just says, you know what, there are times that I'm working long hours figuring out our finances and figuring out how payroll's going to work out and all of these different things, but I know he's up at midnight on Saturday, you know, on Saturday fixing bugs or something like that. So trust is a big deal in that. Do you have any thoughts on that that you want to uh, add? No. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> good. I, I was actually hoping you didn't, but I just wanted to make, you know, I just want to be sure. Do you have a question? Last question. It's been said. Yeah, so, that, so that, this is a great question, right? You have this team. Um, we all know uh, sales can be volatile. Your clients can be volatile. One month you're high, one month you're low. And if you, if you may be off a little bit, you may have to downsize your team or you may have to let someone go because the, 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 the financial health of your business is important. Otherwise, you won't be able to pay anyone else on your team either. How do you, do you, have you guys ever experienced that and to deal with something like that? Yeah, so... Um Things were going great for us. We had about 22 employees, and then September 11th happened, and it was like everything just stopped. Nobody was buying anything, and uh, you know, so we we had to make some tough cuts because at that point, you have a, this huge payroll, and every dollar that you're paying out is literally coming out of your pocket. It's not coming out of like some fictitious bank account, or you know, it's coming out of your pocket. So. You know, you have to do what's, at the end of the day, you have to do what's best for the business and what's best for you. You're the one who started this thing, and you're the one who's, whose neck is on the line. Um, and, and you have to do what's best for you. And if you can keep things going, like we had the same issue in 2008 with the financial crisis, and we held on to um, a, a few people probably longer than we should, and it, it had a, you know, a financial impact on us. But... You know, at the end of the day, you have to just realize that this is, you know, this is your baby, and you've almost killed yourself to keep this thing going, and, and it's, it's your job to keep it uh, alive, and you just have to do what's tough. That's why you own the business. You've got to make tough decisions. You know, like, we've, we've made it a point to keep a pretty large reserve of money just for salary, so we're not as, as susceptible to spikes like that. Um, we're fortunate that we have product revenue in addition to client service, so we do have kind of a buffer that is going to be there to kind of help meet salary and make sure that things are there. But, you know, we've also made it a point to grow slowly. Um, I've never wanted to be in a position where I had to take on work I don't want just to pay the people that I've hired. And I also don't want to be at a point to hire someone I don't really want to hire just to deal with the work that's coming in the door. Um, because once that cycle starts, you're pretty much never going to be out of it. You're either hiring people or you're taking on more work or you're hiring people or you're taking on more work. And then, you know, it grows so fast you, you don't know what you have anymore. So, you know, dealing with, you know, like I've had, I've let people go in the past. Usually it's, it's gotten to the point where like 
everybody's kind of aware. Like everybody knows this is happening. Like it's not a, you're, you know, it's not like waking up and be like, hey, guess what? You don't have a job anymore. Um, or like, why can't I log into my email? Oh, it's because we fired you. Um, <laughs> I'd like to think that that won't ever be a thing that I do. Um, you know, so it's one of those things where we're looking at like, hey, look, you know, the way this is going, we're probably, you know, I don't think we're going to need you much longer. Um, maybe you should start looking. Let us know. We can help you look. Um, more than happy to give recommendations. More than happy to, you know, if, uh, thankfully with the WordPress community, uh, a usually somebody's hiring. Um, and if it's not a, a personality issue, if it's simply work, you know, workflow issue. Um, they're probably not going to be unemployed very long. And, you know, the, the flip side is that if, if they're let go because they're just uh, horrible to work with, they might not be employed very easily. Because um, we all talk. <laughs> um, and, you know, so it's a matter of like, you know, if you're going to let somebody go, you let them go. Um, yeah, you, you help them out as much as possible, um, whether it's severance or whether it's helping them find something somewhere else or whether it's giving them enough lead time. Uh, to get their affairs in order, but you know, it's it, if the, if I if I don't fire someone and the business closes, then what was the point? They're still fired. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, let's just give a, a round to our panelists for taking the time. <laughs> Appreciate them.